The first recorded labor strike is believed to have been way back in 1152 BC in Egypt. Workers completing the tomb for Pharaoh Ramses III were not receiving their standard food rations. Now this was not cool, so they turned to a strike to solve their problems, as have many workers throughout labor history. The NFL is no different and the 1980s brought the most significant strikes between the players and owners. This also led to what was called the scab season. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. Great Scott. This time as we step off our DeLorean, the date is October 15th, 1987, and we're in any NFL city in America. You see, this is when the NFLPA called off their strike. It was one of the most publicized in history. And was this a culmination of a comedy of errors, or was it the beginning of of the light at the end of the tunnel. Now we have to go backwards to figure it out. Did it really work? Well, we'll see because this is part three of a four-part series covering the NFLPA and the fight for player rights. Now back in first episode, we talked about Bill Radovich, the guy known as the father of sports labor action. He didn't start the NFLPA, but he sure did help that ball get a rolling because he gave players hope after the victory that he had over there in the Supreme Court against the NFL for winning an antitrust suit. This would lead into the 1956 foundation of the NFLPA. Then in last episode, we covered the 60s and the 70s, the AFL and NFL merge. There was many small victories, culminating in what would be known as John Mackey versus the NFL. Now this victory was another pivotal moment for the NFLPA and the players because it led to what ended up being the 1977 CBA. Albeit, the owner still had the upper hand, but it was what the players thought in the right direction. And this leads us to this week's topic, the 1980s. Possibly the darkest era in the NFL, because there were so many things going on as far as strikes and player strife with the owners, and let's just get into it so we can figure out what happened. So after the 1977 CBA, like I said, there were not really as many strides as they would have hoped for, but they thought they were in the right direction. However, at the time, the owners, they would share amongst themselves basically equal revenue from the TV and the gate receipts. So they would still fill the stadiums, meaning that paying the players more really didn't mean anything other than their profits are going to go down because the monies coming in are the same, but the monies going out would have been greater. So this time, we have Mr. Ed Garvey at the helm of the NFLPA. He was a Washington-based lawyer, which is a theme that we're going to find out throughout a lot of the NFLPA executives. So for the 1982 CBA, he said, we are going to propose something that is going to help the players from a monetary standpoint. We are going to propose what they call the gross proposal. He wants the players to have 55% of the club's league-wide revenue to be divided amongst the players. And what they had was some kind of simple, maybe not simple formula, but a way to divide it amongst the players was this way. You're going to factor in your years of service in the league, your amount of playing time, your individual and team performance. So basically, this is a pay for performance plan. Not how high you were drafted. It's all about what you do on the field, not what you did before you got in the league. Now, it seems like a good theory at the top of the water, but what's going on underneath? However, this is what the NFLPA site said about this gross proposal plan that they had, and it went as such. The owners summarily rejected the percentage of gross proposal in early 1982, saying they didn't want players as business partners. So, one of the arguments was that the USFL was starting in 1983. An owner said individual contract bargaining had to happen because otherwise we're going to not be able to prevent the USFL from cherry picking players from the NFL because if they go to this individually based contract bargaining, then they're going to just offer our top dogs as much money as they can and then they'll filter out the rest with some of the other guys, but they will still be able to have 
the hot ticket players on their teams. If we go this route, that's not going to work. That's what the owner said. And in last week's episode, I talked about how the NFLPA thought the AFL would give more bargaining power to the players, but that wasn't necessarily the case. Now, you can find this link to that episode in the show notes, which, by the way, you can get to the show notes through your podcast player, or you can head to thefootballhistorydude.com. Also, I ask that you subscribe for free to this show by mashing that little subscribe button on your podcast player choice. That way you get the hottest, freshest out the press episodes each and every week. But back to 1982. With collective bargaining going nowhere, the NFLPA Board of Representatives would vote to call a strike beginning after the second week of the regular season play of the regular seasons in 1982. And the quote from the NFL Films video labeled NFL 82 went as such. All NFL training facilities will be struck. There will be no practices, workouts, or training. We are united in our resolve to be treated and dealt with fairly and with dignity. So, September 20th, players would go on strike. This is the day. However, there was a Monday night game that ended after midnight, so technically I guess it's like the 21st because they said they were going to go on strike officially after the last game of the second week. Now, Garvey officially instructed the players to strike after this Monday night game which happened to be between the New York Giants and the Green Bay Packers. So he's all like, after this game, you know, shut her down, boys. Just shut her down. The owners, they responded, though. They shut down operations themselves entirely on September 21st. So they basically, September 21st of 1982, they locked the players out. You know, it's one of those things where how long can you really hold out there, players not getting a paycheck? But also at the same time, how long are owners willing to pay for these stadiums, you know, you got those fixed costs you got to deal with to have empty seats. The standoff is on. The work stoppage and the shutdown would last NFL for 57 days. It had to be like hell on earth for the fans because this standoff between the owners and the players, but the fans are the ones that are getting hurt. They were even divided, both sides. Some prominent players, they weren't even sold on the strike. Now here's a quote from one of the New York Giants defensive ends. He was on board with it. He said, In 1982, there were some bitter feelings on both sides. We hadn't seen the owner's books, and when we finally were able to see them, we were upset at the percentage of revenue we were receiving. It wasn't fair. Guys were willing to sit out the whole season. We weren't making any money. We were called professional ball players, but we weren't being paid like professional ball players. There was no severance. We didn't have a good pension. Overall, benefits were not good. However, on the other side of the thing, You had players, some prominent players, that were against this strike. Danny White of the Cowboys, he was one of these players that questioned the NFLPA's intentions. During this whole strike season, he uh, spent some time with general manager Tex Schramm of the Cowboys. And Randy White, also of the Cowboys, he had a quote that he told the Dallas Morning News of the situation. And it went as such. The longer the strike went on, the more I felt this wasn't the player strike, but Ed Garvey's strike. All we did was waste eight weeks of football. So, you've got both sides. And it had to be high tension. Eight weeks of no play, but 57 days without having NFL action? Like I said, the fans? They're the ones that suffer the most probably out of this. Well, not really, because you you got the players are not making their money, and you got the owners. But at the same time, everybody involved. And this had the potential to lead towards shutting the NFL down for good. What happened if they would have really just locked the door, sold the stadiums, you know, some soccer team rolls in or some crap like that, just, you know, anything else. But thankfully, that's not what happened. They would come to an agreement, but there were two things that they had to agree on for the ultimate settlement. The first, now it appeared likely that the season would be canceled if regular season's games didn't, you know, they didn't resume in early November. So there was a ticking time bomb, I guess an end of the light tunnel that says if we don't get it by then, well, then it just is going to be shut down. Now, the second was that the owners committed to increased salary and benefit packages worth up to at least $1.28 billion between the 1983 and 1987 seasons. So there we go. The players did accept, but some teams, they, they held out a little bit longer. The ones that were named were the Chicago Bears, New England Patriots, and Detroit Lions. These players, they refused to return to practice until the owners actually signed off on the complete agreement. Hey, who can blame them? The owners have shown throughout the past two episodes to be shady. 
Not saying that owners are all shady, but there was a track record there of making promises and then kind of falling back on them. But then officially, coming back to December 5th of 1982, the CBA was signed. The owners would end up paying $60 million in what they called, quote, money now benefits to cover the lost wages that were during the strike. We're back on, we're going to play some ball. But some of the other benefits that were gained included severance pay, minimum salaries were increased, and there were a lot, uh, quite a few medical related benefits that were into the stipulation of this new CBA agreement. And another thing that the owners agreed to was an agent certification system. This meant that the negotiation for veteran contracts had to be handled through agents that were certified by the NFLPA. And another turning point, would come in 1983. June of 1983, Gene Upshaw would be named the executive director of the NFLPA. And we could have a whole episode dedicated on his career, not just with the NFLPA, but a Hall of Famer. So there's just a lot of things we could deal with. But possibly his greatest contribution overall to the game came during the 80s, where Lewis Sharp, former NFLPA executive committee member, had a quote about Gene Upshaw. And he said that, He was the one person responsible for securing the unfettered freedom of NFL players. I mean, that's a pretty tall order. That's a pretty bold, big statement. I'm sure he wasn't the only person, the one person, but there was a huge leadership movement when he took over as the executive director in June of 1983 because he wasn't going to back down. His goal when he took over the NFLPA was to put it back in the hands of the players. Remember Randy White saying that it was Ed Garvey's strike and not the player strike? Well, you know what, Gene Upshaw? He wanted to make it the player strike. He would help them work on free agency as being their number one bargaining goal before the CBA expired in 1987. But how did he know that free agency was their biggest goal or their their greatest need or what they wanted the most? Well, in 1986, Gene surveyed the entire league to see what the players really cared about the most. Like I said, the players were going to run this one. It wasn't going to be a bunch of lawyers. It was going to be the players. And with Gene Upshaw as their leader, I say it was no surprise that free agency was number one. I mean, they've been dealing with this for a long time. Safety, of course, is important. But at the time, you know, they're thinking about that Cheddar. I mean, for instance, there was only one player that got an offer during the entire tenure of the 1982 CBA, even though there were over 500 that would have been eligible consider you know, free agents, but were they really free? There's no freedom. There's prices to pay. No freedom, no football. That was their mantra. That was their motto. So then another event happened in 1986. The USFL, you gone. They went out of business. Takes another bargaining chip off the table. Now we're back to a monopoly. Take a look. The bargaining begins. Owners reject the idea of free agency proposal. Again, the owners are like, if you don't like it, you can get out of here. So in the spring of 1987, once again, the players voted to authorize a strike. Now this is the season that many people think of when they, when they talk about the strikes of the 80s. This is the season that comes up, the scab season. And the reason for that is because unlike 1982, when the owners locked the players out, well this time, they were going to keep playing games. They were going to have replacement players. You know, again, the scab season, the season of the replacements. But why did they do this? Well, one reason was because in 1982, the networks, the TV networks, that is, they prepaid the NFL. The owners had to pay some money back, but this time, the TV networks, they didn't prepay the NFL. So if they wanted anything to happen, well, they're going to have to put some kind of game on the show, on the TV, on the tube, so they can get some of that money coming in. I mean, money, that makes people do some crazy things, especially these billionaire guys who They've been used to having all this money all the time. So it kind of reminded me of the movie The Replacements. Um, There was a bunch of different jokes going around about the scabs. And there's a lot of heated rivalries and all sorts of things as far as, you know, the scab players versus the real NFL players. And one of my favorite lines to lighten up the mood was there was a sumo wrestler for the the main team. And he was he was sitting there before the game. He's eating all these hard boiled eggs and coach goes over to him. I think it was Gene Hackman. He's like, what are you doing, son? He's all like, got to bulk up, coach. Then he would proceed to go ahead and throw up on the field, and they'd have to have that goofy little huddle thing. It was just a crazy littleness, but uh, getting back to the players. It wasn't just scab players that played. 
because about 15% of the veterans actually crossed the picket lines. And there were some bigger names that crossed the picket lines too, and it was a tough ride because just like most strikes end up getting, it ended up getting very scary for both sides. In fact, the NFLPA, they realized that the owners were willing to do anything, and they would even put an inferior brand of football on the field with these scab players just to keep the revenue coming in for the league. And although this strike didn't last as long as the 1982 strike, it was very highly publicized. It got a lot of national attention. And I'm thinking about it. Do you remember the strike, 1982, 1987? Do you have a personal story about something, how it crushed your dreams, or, you know, you were crazy about something particular with the players or the owners and you're on their side or whatever it is? I'd like to know how it affected you personally. Or maybe you even watched the games and you thought it was kind of cool seeing these players that, you know, previously were out of the league and got a chance to play again. And if you want to share your scab season moment or the 1982 strike, head over to myfootballmoment.com and we'll go ahead and put that in an upcoming show. But then, of course, we all know the strike ended. The NFLPA called off the strike. They would send the players back to work. October 15th, 1987. This is a huge turning point for the uh, whole system here because the NFLPA, they give up on this whole strike business. They're like, you know what, fine, taking them to the courts again. So this same very day, they filed a lawsuit, antitrust suit against the NFL in federal courts in Minnesota. They would challenge the owner's plan of continuing this first right refusal compensation system and other restrictions on players. So again, we're back at the courts. I mean, when will it end? Will it ever going to get to the end of the tunnel for the players and the owners and actually get to our true agreement and not deal with this back and forth business? Well, the lawsuit was named Powell versus NFL after NFL PA President Marvin Powell. And then Judge David Doty in Minnesota, we talked about this cat in a few episodes, he would rule in the favor of the players in January of 1988. November 1st, 1989, however, the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals reversed Doty's previous ruling for players. And from the NFLPA site, this is the reason. The Eighth Circuit Court ruled that so long as a union represented players, they had no rights under antitrust laws to sue owners. The court said the players had to choose between being a union and using their right to strike under labor laws or relinquishing their union rights and pursuing their antitrust rights as individuals in court. So there you have it. They have a decision to make. This is near the end of the 80s. The owners felt like the players would just give it up because they're not going to give up the NFLPA. They felt that they won. But again, we have a twist because two days later, the NFLPA executive committee voted to abandon the NFLPA status as a collective bargaining agent. The players ratified the decision in team meetings thereafter. So there you go. The story continues. And with that being said... The NFLPA gave the players a fighting chance for so many years. However, now they had this tough decision and path to forge without the NFLPA by their side as a union. On December 5, 1989, player reps met in Dallas to finalize the decision to decertify as a union. At the time, this was the death of the NFLPA, or at least as we knew it. But just like the Phoenix out of the ashes, the NFLPA would rise again. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the Football History Dude and were able to gain some knowledge nuggets of possibly the darkest decade in NFL history. Next week is the last of a four-part series covering the history of the NFLPA, so be sure to come back to hear the story of the NFLPA Phoenix rising from the ashes to take the fight back for the players. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. Make sure you're the first to get the next episode. Please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads.